Hello, very nice to see you. Uh, thanks for coming back, or uh, if you, this is your first time, you're very welcome. It's a beautiful day here in York. I look out the window and the sky is blue and the sun is shining. And uh, hopefully, uh, where, wherever you're sitting, uh, the weather is just as good. And um, uh, I hope you've had a good Easter holiday. It's been a, a bit of a strange time. Uh, particularly, this is the first morning back at school. And this is that morning where uh, you've been away on your holidays and you've had some great fun and you've eaten lots of Easter chocolate. And then you've come back and uh, you, you, you see everybody for the first time and you wonder what school's going to be like and what's changed. Uh, but actually, we're not back at school yet. So we'll keep going with these Monday sessions. And uh, it sounds like it's helping quite a few people which is great. Um, so first of all, I want to say today, uh, well done to everybody uh, who took part in challenge one. This was challenge one that we did two weeks ago. Um, and uh, the whole idea of this was we were uh, picking our instruments up maybe for the first time in lots of years. And uh, we were having a go and seeing it, uh, how much of this challenge we could do. And uh, we were particularly focusing on uh, playing in time and we chose different tempos. Um, and then we try to play the, those notes on the right hand side in the patterns or in the scales as they're written. And uh, we had some amazing entries and uh, people shared some videos online, which is great. And other, other people sent them through to me um, so that I could have a listen. And uh, I heard people play the bassoon, play the, uh, play the piano, play the trombone. Um, and uh, I have to say last week's highlight was a guy called Michael. Uh, who played on his uh, electric guitar at 300 beats per minute, and that was really impressive. So that was challenge one, and that was just as a way to uh, help us to start thinking uh, maybe a little bit more uh, theoretically, more deeply in our music, and also to start doing some playing. With those quick fire challenges, um, with every one of these that I design, the idea is that you'll uh, have the opportunity, hopefully, uh, to do it every day. And uh, so even though you've done last uh, the challenge from two weeks ago, um, keep doing it because the more you do it, you'll build technical skill on your instrument and you'll understand music in more detail as we go along. So uh, challenge for today. Um, well, I thought I'd raise the bar a little bit. And uh, so uh, here we go. This is the second challenge. And um, this challenge is focused on the Olympics. And why the Olympics? Well, this is this is Olympic year. 2020 is Olympic year. Um, and it's supposed to be in Tokyo in Japan this year. And of course, because of the coronavirus, it's been put back uh, for a year, we think. Um, but the Olympics is an amazing event, um, which includes uh, people from nations all over the world um, that come together and compete in sports events. And uh, it's a, a, a fantastic time. And, and I think... Um, uh, from people I've heard that have, have competed in uh, those type of events before, it has its ups and its downs. So uh, if you're a sports person, there's sometimes some days where in your preparation everything goes really well, and there's other days where it doesn't quite go so well. Um, but the, there's an overwhelming sense of positivity um, about the Olympic Games and about people coming together to do that. So I was thinking, actually, in this time when we're all separated and we're all in our different houses and... Uh, in different countries around the world, um, what could we focus on uh, that's, uh, where we can think about each other uh, around the world and think about uh, how things fit together? And I got thinking about keys um, because last, last time's challenge was all about 12 keys, or actually the 12 major keys. Um, and actually, in the same way that Olympics is all nations, uh, in the same way, the 12 major keys are all the major keys. Um, the nature of them, the major tonality, uh, means that they have a very positive sound. So I had that linked to Olympics being this overwhelming positive experience. Uh, so I thought I'd keep the, uh, the same kind of pattern as we had last, uh, last time using the 12 um, keys. Um, but I'd focus more on the harmony of those keys because a lot of students, they find it quite difficult um, to, uh, to think about harmony when they compose. So uh, this is uh, for teachers to use or, or this is for, uh, for students to have a go at. But at any point in your career, um, the more deeply you can go into this, 
the more confident you'll be with your music. So let's have a look more in more detail at this challenge. So if we just zoom in over here, um, we've got, first of all, number one, pick up your instrument. That's the first thing to do. And again, if you're joining us for the first time today, it could be that you've got an instrument that you haven't picked up for 10 years and it's away in the garage or in the loft. This is your time to get it out and have a play because uh, that's a positive thing to do during this lock time period. The second thing that you're going to do in this challenge today is choose your challenge. Now we've got challenges at four levels. We've got newcomer, rising star, pro and legend. And obviously you want to get to legend if at all possible in the next two weeks. But whatever level you're working at, that's really important. And uh, you just do whatever you can. Give me a shout if you want some help. Now number three says start the video and you'll see underneath that there's three images um, of uh, video files. There's actually four video files I've created because I created um, one for instruments in F and uh, as that suggests um, I want uh, one of my students said to me um, we must make sure that these challenges they're for everybody so not just different ages and different abilities but for every instrument as well. So, um, so the um, uh, the thing behind this is we want absolutely everybody to be able to take part and have a go with it. Now if uh, I just bring another um, screen into view, let's just have a look at this. This is uh, the notes section in the lower part of this video. And if you have a scroll down and a read of that, you'll find that there are um, these four links uh, that you can see as hyperlinks there. And they all correspond to a different practice video to go alongside this challenge. And the one that I'm going to use, because I'm going to play the piano today, is the one for instruments in C. And you'd also use that for if you were playing the violin, or viola, or cello, or flute, or oboe. But if you play um, trumpet, you're likely to play a trumpet in B flat, in which case you can read the same notes on this occasion as we're going to read in our challenge. But if you choose the instrument in B flat video, the notes won't clash and everything will fit together, and that'll be great. Um, if you also if you play clarinet that's likely to be in B flat if you play an alto saxophone that will be an E flat instrument um, so choose the E flat instrument video and the uh, the last one that I just created uh, is the uh, for instruments in F uh, which is mainly people who play French horn now as it says on there if there are any videos uh, any any instruments that you want to play that don't fit with those keys so maybe I don't know if you play a clarinet in A or something like that and you want me to create that if you just get in touch and uh, we'll uh, sort that out for you so let's just go back into the challenge um, this challenge as I said to you is is designed uh, for all instruments the challenge that's actually on this uh, poster here um, is a little bit more focused towards the piano. So at the bottom uh, of the screen on YouTube, uh, you've also got uh, a little bit more detail of what you would do if you play a single line instrument. So in other words, if uh, when you play the flute, you usually play one note at a time, in which case uh, you can't play all the three, no three notes within a chord. Um, so uh, I've, I've tried to make it as similar as possible, um, but obviously there's a, uh, there's a, a few little tweaks as we've gone along. Okay, so let's go in a little bit more detail then. We have a look at start here and the first thing we come to is newcomer. And if you tuned in just before uh, the, the video started at 12.20 you will have heard this music I've written for us which is music for Olympics. And music, this music uh, follows through the 12 um, uh, keys, the 12 major keys and it starts with the C and then um, it moves through to G and then D and then A. Now if you've no idea why I might have done it in that order or if you've never heard of a circle of fifths or if you've never really studied the theory of harmony before then at the end of this video once I've finished talking about um, performance and uh, showing you demonstrations of how to do these challenges if you stay with me and I'll go through the, uh, the theory of all that uh, for you to see. So let's just go back to here. So in that newcomer task, if that's your choice, you need to play each of those notes uh, once for four beats um, at, at the right time. And uh, the best way I thought to demonstrate this is to, uh, to play it for you. So here's a demonstration video.
Now that's that. So some of you might seem very straightforward, and I might not look too panicked when I played it. Uh, but actually, for some students, that's that's pretty difficult to do, particularly if you're st just starting off um, to learn where the notes are um, on your instrument. Now, in the last week's uh, session, or two weeks ago rather, um, we looked at this, and uh, this picture is available to you again uh, to help you to see uh, how to find notes on the piano. If you play, I don't know, another instrument, so you play the clarinet and you don't know how to find an A-flat on the clarinet, um, I would recommend that if you have a tutor, you uh, drop them a message and say, I want to do this challenge, uh, but I don't know how to play A-flat, can you show me? And they will they could send you a photograph or maybe they'd direct you to a good website. But I'm sure if you Google it, you could find out. And let's be really proactive about if there's things that we haven't learned yet how to do, let's just find out what they are and let's do them. Okay, so that's the first uh, that's the, the, the first level challenge, uh, which is the newcomer level. Um, at, just as last week's challenge, it's really, really important uh, that we play in time. So if we think about um, we think about the, uh, the beats of the bar, one, two, three, four, one, two. Now even though one is not spelt with a W, the word of one, the word sound at the beginning of one is the absolute moment when we must change chord or change um, note from one note to the next. Um, so if, uh, if I just go over to this view for a second, I've got my piano. Um, and so if my first note is a C, which is just here, uh, if I count myself in, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, as I said to you before, when you start thinking about um, having uh, where the notes are on, on your instrument to begin with, that can be really stressful, and I understand that. And one of the reasons that we practice with a tempo, like we saw from uh, Farai's video in the last session, um, is that it forces us to think quickly over a period of time. And the tempo for this second challenge is set at 68 beats per minute to give you just enough time to think about where you need to go to next. And actually, within each of the practice videos, there's a reminder. So if you put your, uh, put your smartphone or your iPad or whatever you're using to watch the video, if you put it on top of the, the piano on your music stand, um, then there should be a visual reminder there uh, every time uh, you need to uh, play, play a note. And actually, the video will tell you what the next note is as well. Um, because uh, for hopefully, over time, you'll start to recognize the, uh, the flow of these chords from one to another. Lots of composers have used this particular progression because it follows something called the circle of fifths. Um, so, um, so the progression is, is helpful, the pattern of the notes is helpful to remember, but there's something on screen to help you there um, to begin with. So let's just have a look back at uh, where we are here. So that's the newcomer task. Let's have a look up to Rising Star. And Rising Star is the next one up. And if you play the piano, um, you can uh, hold each chord down for four beats. Now, I thought if I just show you where these notes come and where where the notes in the C chord come from and things like that. If I'm down here, um, this is in last week's poster. Um, always, the three notes in each of these major chords are on note one, note three, and note five. That's a little bit of a big highlighter pen, so let me just make that smaller. Okay, so it's C, E, and G. If you play those three notes together, that gives you the C major chord. Let's go into the next key up. The next key up is G major. So if we want to find the three notes in the G major chord, we go note one, note three, note five. Uh, if we want to find it out in D major, it's note one, note three, note five. So last time I talked about patterns uh, and, how, and how patterns can help us uh, find things in music. This is a really good example of that. Let's go up into the next key, A major. So we've got A, C sharp, and E. Um, so you should be able to find, as you go along, um, where these, these fit. Now if we go over to the piano view again, you can see the C here with the E and the G. The other way to think about that is you play one, miss one, play one, miss one, play one. And another benefit of that handshake thing, you remember that I taught you last time with the claw and the fist like this, um, then it really helps you if you can put one finger on each note, because then you, you kind of don't have to worry about where your fingers are, I guess. Okay, so we've got note one, note three, note five. 
Now if I keep that hand shape the same and put my thumb on G without even checking whether the notes are right um, I can just press my hand down and that is the correct one. Even if I went into D major which has the F sharp in the middle of it that's correct as well. So in this challenge it will help you if you can get the, the shape right and, and use that theory of play one, miss one, play one, miss one to get the idea. If you're not used to playing chords, that's really good. Now if you're playing on a single line instrument, so one note at a time, I'd like to encourage you to play this rhythm. So if this is our pulse, one, two, three, four. That rhythm would be written as two crotchets in a minute. If you are a singer, and we thought about this this morning, with a how can you do this challenge, you could sing. You could sing NHS or something else that's relevant at this time, if you like to. Um, so the most important thing is that you're thinking about the chord, okay? And there's this second level, even if you're not able to play an instrument where you can play all three notes at the same time, it's still really important that you start thinking about harmony. If you're a student of mu music, if you're doing a GCSE or doing an A-level, it's particularly important because the number of young people that I've worked with who uh, are amazing flautists or amazing trumpeters, but when they sit down to write harmony, they don't understand. Um, then the reason they don't understand is because in their own musical lives, they used to be playing melody lines, single lines. So we're not thinking about notes fitting together so this will really help you with that if you're somebody that's watching this and you struggle with composition um, once you've done this a few times you'll start to feel a lot more comfortable about things okay so let's uh, let's go back into the challenge here we go and uh, and that is rising star now i didn't play you the demo video of it so let's uh, just have a quick look at that go so that's rising star if we just have a look at where those chords are if you want to have the chords in front of you while you play actually if you're playing the piano uh, I've put images of the uh, the hand shapes uh, over the piano uh, in, in the video so you can have that to help but if you just wanted this in front of you you're starting at the bottom there with your C E G and you, you're moving up one by step and just hold the chord down uh, for four beats and see if you can go all the way to the top now you see at the top of these columns it says left hand and right hand because if you play the piano you usually wouldn't play hands separately um, so if we have a look at the pro challenge which is at the bottom there it says play each chord hands together including include broken chords so that's one option or play one of these triumphant rhythms below or both so those rhythms those patterns that are on the screen there um, you quite often find them in fanfares or music that announces something. So we've seen lots of great stuff with the BBC News theme this week uh, with a certain weatherman playing. Um, if you listen to that theme or you listen to other news or announcement type um, themes, you'll often hear uh, dotted rhythms or triplet rhythms. Now, if you've no idea what I mean by dotted rhythms, um, then again, if you stay at the end of this, uh, this session, I'll go through the theory of that. And in fact, if you're wanting to get into this pro level, um, then it'd be really important for you to listen to that so that you can make sure that you're doing it accurately. Now, you could use the triumphant rhythms or you could use the broken chords, which basically just means play each chord. But you instead of playing all the three notes together in what we call a block chord, you're going to separate the notes and, and play them at different times. And you play them in whatever pattern you'd like to. But the, I think one of the challenges with this time is you, you're thinking about um, 
uh, the chord progression, you're thinking about what, 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 which chord uh, follows which chord, but you're also having to use your left hand. And for, uh, for lots of students, they wouldn't necessarily uh, be used to that. So if we look uh, just back at this uh, view for a second, if I was to play a C major chord, let's play it up here, um, and then I take uh, my finger and just play a C in the bass. Now quite often when I play the piano, I don't just play this C, I find it a comfortable place so that both hands are on the piano to play an octave C. So I'm playing this C and this C at the same time. You do whatever you think is, is the best thing for you, that's, that's really important. You must be comfortable as you do this, okay? Um, but uh, if we did it with the octave, it would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I'd be encouraging you, um, as soon as you've pressed the chord down, be looking ahead, thinking about, and, and actually the tempo thing, the pulse in the background, that should be something that you start to internalize and start to feel rather than be counting and thinking because you've got enough to think about in working out where that handshape is for the next um, for the next chord uh, when we go along okay so that's how to do the uh, uh, the pro um, what I've suggested for a sing single note instruments um, is I think you should be also thinking about rhythm at that point so I didn't demonstrate that actually so if we just come back here I might go So as we go through the four beats per chord, but I'm going to play a different rhythm within that four beats. So it's not just the case of holding something down. So it is quite a lot harder than um, the, the the rising star uh, uh, challenge that uh, we talked about just before. Okay, let's have a quick look at the demo for for the pro. Okay, so if we think through the challenges and, the, and the, what is difficult about each stage so far. Well, the newcomer was knowing how to play the notes, how to find the notes, and being able to find them quickly so that you stay in time with something that's changing every four beats. The rising star was knowing what the notes and the chords are by hand shape or by hand position, uh, depending on which instrument you're playing, and then being able to find and think about those chords quickly enough uh, within a, a simple pattern, the two crotchets and a minim, uh, to be able to uh, to do that, that that next level. And then when we got to the pro level, we're playing, if you're playing piano, two hands together, and whatever instrument you're playing, you're starting to think about the rhythm that you're playing within that as well. So all the time you're pushing um, the, uh, the technique, the, actually the technique of playing your instrument, um, you're just, you're, you're thinking about things that are a lot more complicated than actually just finding the note and playing it. And that's the key. And the more you can do that, the more confident you'll be um, about the basics, the fundamentals of making sounds with your instrument. Now, we move into the legend. And I, I noticed from uh, doing the first challenge that we had a lot of people who are professional level musicians uh, having a go at the challenge, which is fantastic. Uh, but I wanted to give them uh, an extra challenge. And, uh, and I, Actually, equally, I had uh, an amazing young man in year seven uh, uh, who, uh, who I know from in York, and, uh, and he played an incredible tempo and incredible accuracy and managed to get to the legend standard within that first challenge. I wonder whether he could, and whether others of you who are younger people, whether you, could, um, you can get to the legend um, point of this challenge within the two weeks. I challenge you to do that, okay? Um, and the key thing is actually to do with uh, how we 
kind of come away from just playing chords as blocks. And and uh, what's really important, I guess, is um, making it into something that is more unique and you create a style in what you do. So if I was to again play my C major chord here. Now the other thing, if I've got my hand in this position, is I could play the notes separately. Notice that I'm not even looking at the piano. I don't need to look at the piano because I know my hand's in the right place and I can just do that. Okay, so I can play all sorts of melodies. You can just do that because you know that the notes are in the right place in the right key. Even from last week though, you could play the scale. I see major scale is, is, is relatively simple to play. Um, but, uh, but you know the notes that are within C major, okay? So, so that's the starting point with this. And um, Legend is all about coming away from just playing the notes of the chords. It's also about using something called inversions. Inversions are uh, uh, absolutely brilliant uh, from a composer's point of view because it gives you so many more options and it makes, I think it makes your music a higher quality as well. So if we take um, the three notes of the C chord and instead of playing the G at the top, we play it at the bottom of the chord instead. So that's still a C chord. It's called a second inversion C chord because, well, it is. So I'll come to that another time. Um, but this is still a C chord. And the reason that I've played it like that is because I know that my next chord is G. And I know that in a G chord, I've got G, B and D. So you'd, um, I said to you earlier that the reason it was so easy for me to play this melody in C is because my fingers were over the notes um, to begin with. As a piano player, if you start with this chord of C here, this inversion, to move to G, you hardly have to move your hand. So then you don't have to think about that. You don't, and uh, that, that means you can do something more complicated uh, together with it. And one of the cha real challenges when you're playing a musical instrument is listening at the same time as playing. Because you, uh, a lot of the stu students that I, I, I've, uh, I've worked with really want to concentrate on absolutely making sure it's perfect. But by making sure it's perfect and having that kind of focus, you're then uh, very restricted and very tied into what you can do. And people are uh, afraid to come away from that. But actually, to be properly creative, and to be confident in your composition, you need to be able to do that. So, there's my C chord. Go to G. Now, this could be a really interesting task for you to do anyway. I wonder what's the simplest way, or the, uh, so we say, the shortest distance away to get from the G to the D chord. And for me, it's there. Um, so, I've got my F sharp, my A, and my D. Those are the three notes in the D chord. Okay, now from D, I want to go to A. There's A, then to E then to B, then to F sharp, then to D flat, then to A flat, then to E flat, then to B flat, then to F, then to C. Okay, amazing. So being able to, you saw I was really having to think about it as I went along, but all the time I was thinking about hand shape and about how, how little, what's the minimal, space that I can use my uh, with my hands there. Okay, let's look at the left hand for a second if you are doing this on the piano. And it, it, I would say to you, if, you, if you're a single line instrument and, uh, and you don't play the piano, try, it's great. You'll learn lots of other things that you didn't know about music you couldn't do before. Um, so uh, if we look at the left hand here, you see I use my C and the C, I talked about playing octaves or having that kind of position, but also very helpfully, just where this finger here is here is on G and by keeping that kind of really strong sound using notes one and five the tonic and the dominant it means that I can create a very full sound I press uh, right hand and left hand down together so I'm using bass notes top notes and middle notes okay so we'll six notes going on at the same time there but it's not actually that complicated to do if you follow the pattern now from that position in my left hand um, I could instead of going all the way up to G up to there I could just play one and five here okay so let's look at how, how that might progress 
broken chords. And all the time, if I play the notes that are in those chords that we've learned and that are on your sheet, um, then you know that they're going to work um, in each of the bars with the keys uh, with, in, the, in the progression as, it, as it's structured within this piece. Okay, so in that first bar, if you play anything that is in the chord of C, it will work. It doesn't matter what rhythm you play, as long as it's in time, um, it will work. It will fit musically fit together, and you'll start, oh, I can do this. It's very exciting. Then in the second bar, we're going to move into G major, so use any notes from the G chord, and that will fit nicely together. Okay, and we go through each of them. Now, if you're like me, and when I was growing up, I played things in C major and G major and D major and A major, and then got really scared uh, because I thought, oh, more sharps and flats, uh, I can't deal with that. And I made the mistake when I was younger of playing music that was simple to play. And I wish, if I could turn the clock back, I wish that uh, somebody had said to me, there's nothing to be afraid of with uh, all, all the other keys, because actually... Um, they're just different patterns and different shapes and, 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 and actually we shouldn't be afraid of any, anything like that at all. So I made for you a, a video of, uh, of what could be a legend uh, performance. Here we go. Okay, so that was obviously um, more, much more complicated than what we've been talking about. The main reason, actually, was because it was improvised. It was completely made up on the spot. It wasn't really quite made up on the spot, was it? Because we had our, um, our pre-determined row of 12 chords to follow. Uh, and actually, uh, what I did is put my hands over those chords, and I played rhythmically. So almost like you're tapping a, tapping a table or, you know, if you sit and listen to a piece of music, you might tap along to it. I was kind of doing that while I was listening, thinking about the pulse, and I was using um, other notes in the scales as well. Now, you heard some of it sound a little bit more jazzy. Uh, let's have a look at that. So I'm using the blues notes or a blues scale. Um, there's all sorts, apart from the major scales that we're looking at at the moment, there's all sorts of other scales. Um, and uh, uh, you, can, you can find them online, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, so don't just restrict yourself to the, the notes within the major scale, but if you think about you're, you're using chords 
within C and find out what other note rows are available within C. You notice in that video I played uh, over three times of the progression um, and what I challenge you to do if you're working towards legend status is that you want to try and um, develop it, make it more complex every time. Could mean that you need to keep it relatively simple in that first time through. Um, but challenge yourself, whatever level you're working at, challenge yourself um, to get more and more and more complex. I have to say when I recorded that video um, yesterday, and uh, honestly that was take one, um, but uh, when I started thinking blues notes in the key of F sharp major where, no, I don't do that enough. Um, and that's a challenge for me to, uh, to go away and think about that. Okay, so, uh, so that is uh, Quickfire Challenge 2. And uh, I hope you'll have lots of fun with that. Um, I'm going to go into the theory stuff in a moment. So, uh, uh, so it could be that, uh, that this is where uh, some of you leave me for today. Um, but uh, two weeks to do that. Um, there will be a Make Music on Mondays next week. And uh, we're going to launch our virtual orchestra next week. I'm going to teach you uh, to play a, a piece of music that I wrote a few years ago that uh, a lot of people really enjoy to play. Um, there's some improvising in it, but we're not going to do the improvising section yet. So whatever you can do from this challenge will really help you if you want to take part in that later. And uh, if you are um, coming back next week, uh, we will start, get started into teaching you that piece of music. And then there'll be another quick fire challenge uh, to help us to take this, this adventure onto the next level uh, in two weeks time. Okay. So, if you're staying with me, um, let's move on to uh, the theory and uh, let's see if we can go a little deeper into our understanding. So, there are four theoretical uh, things that I just want to touch on today to give you a little bit more uh, advice about. They are dotted rhythms, major scales, designing a structure of harmony, and the whole world is closely related, it says. And that's actually going to be about circle of fifths when we get there to the end. Okay, so let's start off with dotted rhythms. And uh, if I draw, for example, this rhythm, it could be that when you, if you're a young musician and you see that on a piece of music, when you first sit down and you think, oh my word, that's complicated. How am I going to play that? Actually, it's really simple. So I'm going to talk, teach, talk you through it. Okay, and all we need to do is, I'm just going to draw a box, and this box represents one beat. And so actually if I started at the beginning of this beat and I played a crotchet, my crotchet beat would last for the whole of the beat. But um, the reason that uh, this rhythm here is more complicated is because it requires us to break up that beat and think about things separately. So another rhythm that, um, that it looks very similar to is this rhythm, where we've got two quavers. So whereas uh, if I concentrate on this note for a moment, if this is the pulse, and my student learned this is T, T, T. So you get one note, one sound per beat. If we look at this group here, uh, then you get two sounds per, per beat. Coffee, coffee, coffee. Coffee, kind of forward and back, something coming forward and back. If I was to draw this on this grid at the bottom, then I'd have one quaver there and one quaver there. Um, and this one would last for this part of my beat, this one would last for this part of my beat. But I don't have that, I have this. And uh, the thing that we have that makes it more complicated is a dot. It doesn't make it that much more complicated because it just adds half the value again. So instead of it being half a beat long, it's half of a half. Well, if you think of a cake, it's cut in half, and you have half of a half, then each one of these is worth a quarter. So half plus a quarter, or if you like, all of whoops, all of this area that I'll show you then properly. There we go, then that is three quarters. So then you look at those boxes below and you can see that if I draw this with a dot after it, it will last for three boxes of the four. And then the semiquaver just lasts for the last one. Okay, so if I give each of these, these four subdivisions of the beat a number, 
one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then if you clap on, we would say that this one is one, and this one here is four. Then to clap that dotted rhythm, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And that's dotted rhythms, that's that's how it works. Now, if um, you've got something that's a little bit more complicated than that, um, so uh, one of the rhythms that I drew just before was like this, where you've got demi semi quavers, I know who were, um, then actually that's, that's actually dead easy if we've done it in this way, because that, that dotted um that dotted quaver doesn't change that was still the same but it just means that in the same way that i have two quavers that fit into one crotchet here I have two demi semi quavers that fit into that final bit of the note so um one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four okay just like that and um, and so that's a that's a good way to start thinking about uh, dotted notes. Okay, let's come back to a second. So if you're writing triumphant music, you're writing uh, say the arrival of something, or maybe you're writing a news theme, or maybe you're working on a film and uh, the king's arrived, or or something like that, then um, then you want to uh, think about using dotted dotted rhythms. Um, brass players, lots of brass players often play fanfares. So if you are um, a trumpet or a trombonist, you're going to really enjoy this challenge. Okay, that's the first the first part of the theory. All right, let's look at where we're going next. So the next thing is major scales. Let's just grab a new one. So there's a pattern, like a key, if you like, a secret a secret key. It's not a secret. Um, in a major scale um, that is to do with tones and semitones and that's the pattern there tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone now if you've no idea what on earth I'm on about then there's probably good reason for that so let's let's just show you here so this is a bit of a piano C, that's C sharp or D flat D, that's D sharp or E flat Sorry, that's the black key there, and E there. Now, the distance from one key to the next, okay, and very importantly, the, the C sharp is just in between the C and the D, so the next is the black key there. Um, the distance between that and the next is called a semitone, okay, so that's what that S is for there. But if we didn't want to move from uh, from there, we wanted to go from the C to the D because that's two semitones. Then we, it's actually referred to as a tone. All right. So it's about the distances between notes. Now to work this out, I'm going to draw us uh, a fuller piano here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Felt like I needed to hum a bit of a tune there while we go along. Okay, we've got C, D, E, F. G, A, B, C. Now to prove that this is the pattern for a major scale, we know what the notes are, are in C major. So if we start with C, we think about what's a tone above uh, C. A tone above C is D. And then we think about, well, what's a tone above D? That's E. Next one is a semitone above E. Well, that's the next key along. So the next key along from E is F. And then we need a tone above F, which is G. Tone above G, which is A. Oops, my brackets have gone a bit wayward. Sorry about that. Tone above A is B. And then we want one semi, one semitone up to C. And true, truly enough, those are the, the notes in the C major scale. Now, we can work out the notes, because we know that pattern, we can work out the notes in any scale. So imagine if you were um, you were working on a, uh, a piece of music, uh, maybe you're working on a song, and you had the melody go round in your your, your head, and uh, your, your way to write music is not sitting in front of a computer screen. Your way to write music is um, sitting in the park when you're allowed, um, and, uh, and recording uh, melodies that come into your head just by recording onto your iPhone or whatever you use. And imagine that you got home and you wanted to know, you wanted to work out what key um, you've been working in, and uh, and you found that the, actually the finishing note 
all the the, the notes that uh, the music sounded like it was finished on wasn't a C. Um, unfortunately, it was an F sharp. And you think, well, if I could sing it in a different key, but actually it doesn't feel right. It feels like it should be in F sharp, and I, maybe I wouldn't encourage you to. Maybe I would. I don't know. Um, so let's uh, let's work out the notes in the key of F sharp major. So um, we've got F sharp. A tone above F sharp is G sharp. A tone above G sharp is A sharp. So we've got a tone, tone. And we need a semitone here. So a tone above A sharp is B. Then a tone above B, C sharp. A tone above C sharp is D sharp. A tone above D sharp. Now a tone above D sharp, we, we wouldn't call it F because we need F to be F sharp at the end. We'd call it E sharp. So it'd actually be the same as playing an F. This is the same as playing an F. But we, it's really important that we call it E sharp. And sure enough, yes, those are the notes in the F sharp major scale. So this pattern at the top, um, if I just change this to green, oops. This pattern at the top is really helpful for us to be able to work out the notes in any major scale. And if you go away and you, you kind of find out and you want, you want to check if I'm right, um, then you can use this to check against. And uh, as I said to you before, those are all the major scopes, and uh, you can start on any key. Now, one thing that uh, you might notice is in D flat major, what if you wanted it to be called C sharp major? In fact, you're absolutely right. C sharp major is a key, but it's it's slightly harder to work in because you're having to think about seven sharps in the key signature as opposed to five flats, as you would in D flat major. Okay, right. Let's look at the next one: designing a structure of harmony. So this section is all about, it's a bit about composing really, um, because I'm very aware that students are finding it difficult to uh, come up with starting points uh, that are very, very helpful. Um, so I'm going to come up with this chord sequence. And all of these boxes are supposed to be equal. Whoops, that's a triangle. Are supposed to be equal, but um, we're, we're a little bit short of time. And each of these boxes represents uh, a bar of music. In this case, I've decided that each that my chords are going to change once every bar. I've decided that I'm going to uh, my music's going to start in the key of C or on the chord of C, and uh, then in my second bar it's going to move to G, and I'm going to move in fifths. We'll explain what fifths mean in a moment. So this goes back to, oh I've put C sharp in there, it could be D flat, let's put or D flat. This goes back to that idea that I had before of um, wanting to use all of the keys and uh, to represent all of the nations that come together in Olympics. Um, so I could have put these chords into any any order whatsoever. Um, uh, or I could have just used three of the chords or two of the chords or probably wouldn't use one of the chords because it would be the same all over and over and over all the way through. It feel like there was no variation in the harmony and you want there to be variation in the harmony. Um, you don't want the music to be boring, you want to maintain a sense of interest. Now as we go through um, each of these 12 chords it changes every time. It could be that in your music you don't want it to change every time. That could be it could be changing too much, um, and and the rate of change of harmony it really does have a, a, a very significant impact on the music. Which is why if you get your harmony wrong in a composition, or if you're not in control of your harmony, it can be really a, a, a really serious thing. Um, and so uh, students all over the country, you may well uh, have had this experience uh, where your teacher's written on something about uh, th there's problems in the harmony. It's something so fundamental that you must get it right, which means you must plan it like this. And uh, if we just go back to the sheet a second, it actually doesn't matter which chords you put where. 
I'm going to say that generally. It doesn't matter because um, what matters is you are making a choice and you're deciding that this is going to be the first box here and then in the second box you're going and you're planning it out and you're deciding what happens when. And that's what structure is all about. The worst music or the worst say if we say GCSE music for a second that I come across is music where there's been no sense of uh, plan at all maybe the students not even listen to it um, and then they go right I've made some music and I've finished it there has to be some kind of plan um, and uh, it could be that to begin with you, you can't you can't see that that plan to design it you haven't had the enough experience of writing lots of pieces to know oh that will be good there and that will be good there I need to do that um, but actually the more you do it the more ideas you'll find of, of what works together or, or that's a good idea I might uh, I'll put a I'll put a bar of C there and maybe uh, I'll put a G chord in the fourth beat and then I'll go into D major or something like that so um, uh, over as you write more and as you get more experienced in this um, then this planning is something that you've just got to remember to do that's the most important thing okay so that, so a very very simple approach to the structure there. Let's have a look back at our checklist. We're nearly finished. And the last thing was this: the whole world is closely related. Okay. So the order of those chords that I've just put together and that I wrote in this piece of music we've been using today, the order of the chords is really important. And the order of them is important because they're closely related tonally. And what that means is. Um, Different keys have, uh, as we know from our patterns of working things out, different numbers of sharps and flats. If I went through, let's see if we can see the pattern here. So C major, there's no sharps and flats. We know that. G major, there's one sharp. D major, there's two sharps. A major, there's three sharps. B e major, there's four sharps. B e major, there's five sharps. F sharp major, there's six sharps. Hope you can see the pattern by now. If we went into C sharp major, we say the C sharps, uh, sorry, seven sharps. The D flat major is five flats. A flat major is four flats. B flat major is three flats. B flat major is two flats. And in F major, there's one flat. And in fact, if you follow that pattern, then you'll know that if we went on to the next one in that series, it will go back to C because um, that just follows the pattern through. Okay, so then you think about, well, why on earth does that happen? And you kind of go, uh, well, that's that's strange because C is nowhere near G in the alphabet and and D, uh, what, what's that about? It doesn't really feel like it makes sense, but it does make sense if we consider what the circle of fifths is all about. Okay, so last thing today, if I was to draw the notes on the piano, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and we were to give the the note C a number one. In fact, let's give them all numbers: five, six, seven, and C again. So it's one at the top. I want to find out what a note the note is that is a perfect fifth. That it's called an interval, a perfect fifth above C. So I look at C as one, and I want to know what five is. So it's G. So C to G, or C and G together, is a perfect fifth. Now if I go back over to the piano, if I play my C, play my G, it creates that nice, very open kind of sound. I play those two notes together. Now when I was younger and I was learning this for the first time, my piano teacher very helpfully said to me, the soldiers are coming. And that's what it sounds like. So if, you, if you've watched an old Western film, you might have heard this little melody in the orchestration okay so that open sound of C to a G is called a perfect fifth now um, we've got the keyboard there on the screen so that's helpful to us instead of um, C being one let's have G as one okay so let's have G as one what's five one two three four five it's D check the relationship by playing them like that okay so if we go back into here we can go well the next one is G so we've got one sharp there D is two sharps 
So let's work it out. If D was 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is A. It's three shots. And so it goes on. Actually, let's bring E down here. So I want to go from E. We've got E to B. But then we've got a problem when we get to B. And let me just bring the piano back up to show you this problem. So, I'm on B here. I want to go up to 5. I get to F. If I play B and F together, that doesn't sound right. That's not that open sound. That sounds like somebody's going to chase you, and they're, they're not going to be nice to you. All right, so instead of the F, it must be F something else. What else do we have around there? Well, we have F sharp. There we go, so it's F sharp. So that's, that's a little bit of a change. So it's not quite as simple as going 1 to 5. Um, so let's just nip back into our workbook here. Um, so the E was four sharps, the B was five sharps, the F sharp six sharps, and then from F sharp you can go to C sharp, which is seven sharps. If we go the other direction, and we think what if C was five, five, four, three, two, one, it's F that's one. So it's one flat. So that's how you do the flats, you go you go in the other direction. Okay, so I hope that was really interesting for you. I hope it was helpful. I hope it's helped you to go uh, deeper into your theory. Um, but um, but the challenge for this week and the, the next couple of weeks, um, have, have a great time with it and uh, let me know how you get on. If you're allowed to, uh, then uh, use the hashtag quickfire music challenge um, and share your, share your work online. But like I say, if you're somebody under the age of 18, please do check with your parents before uh, posting, any, whoops, posting any kind of um, uh, video material onto social media. That's really, really important. And uh, I, will, uh, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.